So I think we'll get started. So first of all, is everyone by show of hands or clap? Everyone having a good time? Yes, okay, good, good, good. Awesome, awesome. So um, today, I'm a CSM, by the way, customer success. Um, so one of our accounts, our customers, a very good customer, in fact, is um, for direct. So what they're gonna go through, Tom Thomas right here, and Ed Engelin, um, they're gonna go through their journey of Domo, what they've done to automate their business process, and how they've used Domo for their best practices. All right, Tom and Ed. Good. All right, so, okay, we're on here. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm Tom, I run data strategy, business intelligence, and analytics at Ford Direct. Um, I've been leading technology solutions for the past 25 years in either management consulting, I've been an entrepreneur. And the latter half of my career has really been in digital advertising, focused primarily on marketing intelligence and strategy. And today, what we're gonna talk about, I think is a common thing that we face in the business intelligence space, which is, you know, how do you leverage your sophisticated data analytics platform with all of its cloud-based goodness and dynamic chart building mobile capability to give what your users are consistently asking for, which is something portable in Microsoft product, or in Microsoft Office. Office, right. <laughs> so um, if you think about uh, when you've told data stories before to your business units, um, is it the first thing you think about is to whip out your mobile phone, start swiping through Domo cards, or are you being asked to figure out a way to extract that sophistication out of your platform and load it into another PowerPoint deck? Because the reality is, is a lot of our audiences still require something to hold on to, to page through, to scribble notes on, take back to their office if they were to, to study, right. if they were too self-conscious to ask a question during the meeting. And if you can, if you can envision uh, a digital performance consultant in the field um, trying to explain a complex digital performance story you know, to the general manager inside a loud and noisy car dealership, who, who might have given that consultant an hour of their time initially, but then cut it short to 10 minutes because they had something to do. At that point, that consultant's desperate to leave something printed you know, in their office so they can look over it for, um, later. So we, um, so the, uh, the idea is to essentially, um, what our presentation is gonna be about is how we leverage new analytic technology to solve the business need for old school formatting. And so this should resonate most to, to, to those of you who supply business intelligence to like a sales team or customer support organization, a consulting discipline, or if you're trying to figure out how to, how to get data and visualizations out of your analytics platform and assemble it, the content dynamically and automatically and then print it in high volumes um, and a high frequency. And if there's anybody out here who's you know, dealing with layers of business rules, complex ETL, fragmented data, new technologies, or a wide variety of user visualization requirements, then this, uh, that should cover the rest of the room, I think. So this will be a good conversation, hopefully, for everyone. So a little bit about Ford Direct. So Ford Direct is a joint venture between Ford Motor Company and the 4,000 Ford and Lincoln dealers across North America. Um, we are the primary digital solutions provider for um, the dealerships in the support of vehicle sales and service. We were founded in 2000 um, in response to the disruptive and monumental shift in the way dealers needed to do business to respond to the online shopper. Um, and if you know anything about the auto industry, the way it's you know, <coughs> advertising and communication to the marketplace is done is it's broken down into three tiers. So tier one, you have the OEM, Ford in this case, establishing the brand at the national and global level. Um, at tier two, you have dealers pooling their money together in regional efforts to advertise at the regional level. So if you see those commercials like, this is brought to you by your Southeast Michigan Ford dealers, that's what by that's Ford all about. Yep. And tier three is where the, uh, the dealers are actually duking it out amongst themselves and advertising with their own technologies, messaging, creative agencies um, at the local level to establish their presence, to expose their inventory. And this worked for many, many years um, when the channels were mainly just print, TV, um, and outdoor. Um, but in the late 90s, with the internet and online shopping starting to occur, the dealers started to face a whole bunch of new challenges in how they connected with their customers. 
Um, you had third-party lead aggregators or websites that popped up like KBB and AutoTrader attracting customers to their websites to uh, generate these internet leads and they'd sell those back to the dealership. So essentially a new middleman had popped up into the shopping funnel for the dealers that they had to deal with. Um, the OEMs themselves were trying to sell vehicles straight out of the factory and around the dealership online to customers. And dealers were trying to figure out how to tackle this by throwing up a website any way they could with any tech they could find, not really adhering to any creative or uh, functionality standards. And they're also trying to figure out these digital channels to communicate to customers with, like search and display advertising and this new thing called social media. And so in 2000, um, in order to calm the chaos really between Ford and the dealer franchise network, um, as well as ensure a consistent online experience for the shopper as they would visit Ford.com um, and then maybe navigate to any one of the, of the 4,000 dealer websites, um, Ford Direct was created. And really starting with uh, online lead management from those leads generated on Ford.com and those third-party websites, we now provide um, a solution or a product for the majority of the digital channels that are available today for dealers. So we have a website platform that covers 99% of the dealers in the country. Um, that's over 4,000 sites. Uh, we have an advertising program that covers uh, search, social, and display media for the, for the dealers. We offer a direct communications program with email and direct mail, an online reputation management service, and then we have several in-store and dealer solutions like uh, inventory management and CRM. And um, today we, uh, we manage hundreds of millions of dollars of advertising on behalf of the dealers and millions of customer records we now uh, manage, control, store, and analyze. And there's really nothing like it in the industry, or at least in the auto industry, um, because it really offers uh, the opportunity for the leadership across these three tiers to get together, to share ideas, to share strategy, share data, share technology and even financing to do what's best for the Ford and Lincoln customer. Now with that, um, Ford Direct's unique data advantage in that it sits in between the OEM and the dealer network is that we have the sole uh, access to a wide variety of data. So if you think about the data we can get access from Ford, you know, regarding the um, online shopping that's happening on Ford.com or the shopper's response to the tier one media, we, can, we have access to all the incentive and offer data, the customer lifecycle data. Um, we also can see the shopper on the tier two website or buyfordnow.com. We have exclusive access to lucrative third party data about the shopping audiences that are out there so we can help us with our audience strategies. We try to coordinate communicating across the three tiers. And then we have dealer data, and at the, individual, at the individual dealer level, where we can see the inventory situation and the vehicle trades happening between dealerships, as well as what's going on in the showroom with the CRM. And then the probably the most powerful uh, data that we have is seeing the consumer response at tier three across any of those 4,000 websites as they navigate across those and even to tier one and two websites. We can see the advertising response um, paid uh, search, social, and uh, display media, and the response in the direct channels, or the direct communication channels like email. And so it's, it's at a pretty amazing spot in, that I've seen in my career to where you can see all this holistically and really start to stitch a shopping journey together across these three tiers unlike I've ever seen before. And um, it's the wrangling and the capture and the the uh, evaluation of this data so that we can take action on it on behalf of our dealers is really the responsibility of my organization. And so we sit within the corporate strategy function uh, so that we can be more forward uh, in terms of leading the business. Um, the organization's divided into three disciplines. So we have data strategy, which has to do with anything related to data for the company. Um, so that's our master data management, uh, enterprise data cataloging. Uh, privacy uh, and security, governance, and uh, consumer consent management, which is a really hot topic right now. Um, the business intelligence discipline is really the largest team I have, uh, which is really doing all overall performance measurement of our products, as well as our, our internal business units like HR, finance, um, IT. And then we have advanced analytics. So it's our team of data scientists and statisticians really trying to tackle those complex and sophisticated questions the business is asking. So our advanced segmentation, multi-touch attribution, 
um, media mix modeling, things of that nature. And then we have a performance marketing and analytics uh, and machine learning group, which is a team that's uh, specifically focused on um, a tier three marketing platform that we're in the process of developing, which is really an omni-channel, connected omni-channel platform for dealers um, where we're trying to use machine learning uh, to under, just figure out next best action messaging for the dealers to the customers uh, to ensure a more personalized experience that they can offer. So these four disciplines are you know, the, you know, the homes of data analysts that come from different experience backgrounds, different skill sets, uh, and they're supported by a, a central data center of excellence, which is made up of data engineers. They're responsible for the ingestion, the cleansing, the um, ETL, and the visualization engineering you know, for the needs of these different groups for the broader enterprise. So it's a distributed analyst organization across the uh, company supported by a central engineering and science team. Now, just talking specifically about our business intelligence group, um, we have two ways of, of deploying BI in the organization. More traditionally, where you establish all your requirements up front, and you kind of have a, like a waterfall method to produce static reporting or maybe a dashboard with a lot of functionality and uh, filtering. And then we have our self-service BI, which is our newer discipline that we've been in development with, which is really taking off you know, using Domo. And our mission there is really to expand the data availability across the company so that we can produce more and more value for our customers. It's to um, shift to a more data-driven culture so that we start to uncover insights at a faster pace to drive our strategic thinking. And it's also to promote data literacy across the company so that we can make more intelligent business decisions um, it, it, with data and analysis in addition to you know, gut and experience, which is what's, what's been more in the, in the past. And if you're not familiar with the term data literacy, I mean, it's essentially just getting the organization to speak a common language and think in a way that gets the creators of data and the consumers of the data basically on the same page. And the best way that should start is with the leadership of, a, of an organization, because there's still a lot of leaders and companies today, the more non-technical leaders that are starting to talk a lot about data, um, because they know it's in the the new hot topic, but they're talking about it on the surface, and, and it's good that they are talking about it, but they don't quite know how to use it in a way that kind of pushes the, the business forward into new territory. And we found that our um, Domo uh, adoption in the company, our self-service BI capability has given them, you know, a more hands-on uh, a feeling of the data. They're getting a little bit dirty with it, and it's, and it's enlightening them to ask more sophisticated questions, which is what the company needs. And in terms of how we're deploying our platform, you know, we're aligning, or aligning the requirements of the platform to the vision or the strategic vision of the company and uh, our core success measures. We deploy in an agile fashion um, in sprint modes every two weeks. And our mantra on the team is to really fail fast and fail forward. I mean, it's better to get something into the hands of the users fast than it is to wait till it's perfect. You know, because the longer it takes for something to get in their hands, the more they start to question um, the expensive team members as well as all these licenses for cool technology that are out there available for analytics. And right now our self-service uh, platform is really supporting three lines of business right now. Um, our dealer products organization, as I started to talk about before, that we provide to the dealers is um, a large number of teams supporting 17 different products and solutions around digital marketing for the dealers. And what we're doing is measuring the performance of those products, both in terms of how they impact the Ford Direct business from a financial standpoint. Um, so are we looking at enrollments and terminations and overall satisfaction with a particular product, as well as we're measuring the actual performance of the product itself. So if you think about the website platform that I talked about, we offer four different versions of websites to the dealers. Um, and we're looking every day at those unique visits, those vehicle detail page views, inventory searches, how many form leads versus phone leads are being generated on the websites. And we're looking at those four different versions and comparing them to each other, making sure you know, they're fitting for the right type of dealer. And we have to do that for all the different products that we offer. There's different KPIs. Um, most of our products involve a technology partner that's actually executing the, the service and the messaging itself. So they have their own way of capturing that data um, in their own data stores, so we have to get access to that. And deploying 
you know, more traditional BI to a team like this that's constantly evolving with so many products would be cost prohibitive, right? So we're trying to use the self-service BI mentality to get Domo champions out there to start using um, large flexible data sets that we're building for them to build their own cards and pages and ask their own questions and, and answer them for themselves. We also have self-service BI going on for the business <coughs> operations group, um, which is responsible for executive reporting, measuring the satisfaction of Ford Direct in, term, in the eyes of the dealers, in the eyes of the employees, and in the eyes of Ford. And we also use it to track our uh, internal project progress. And then lastly, the customer engagement team, which is the field force that I was referring to, that are out there in the field trying to summarize um, the performance of the dealer's digital marketing ecosystem and trying to help them with what to do next. Um, we use self-service BI in the management of that team to make sure we're evaluating the performance of the, um, the consultants themselves as well as how well the assessments are going and making sure they're in the right place um, across the country, so sort of optimizing the organization. This also is where our case study lies today, is in our customer engagement unit. Um, and so I, at this moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed to start talking about that. Um, Ed is our Director of Self-Service Business Intelligence at Ford Direct. And he's a big guy, but he, you know, he's got, he's got a lot of weight. He's got a lot yeah. on his shoulders, and he's executed tremendously in the last just year and a half with not having Domo in the environment at all. Everything from connecting it and setting it up to developing the methodology for deployment and adoption across the enterprise, setting up a training curriculum, setting up Domo champions, as well as then supporting the solutions that we have in place. So at this point, I'm gonna let him take it from here. Cool. Here you go. Thank you, Tom. All right. Um, so, yeah, so everybody goes through kind of this journey, right? It's the adaptive kind of journey where, hey, use Domo because I'm telling you to, right? And kind of the nirvana state, what we're trying to all get to is, hey, I'm gonna use Domo because I see the value, right? So a lot of things during that journey is kind of, you need a mechanism to figure out, are people actually using this thing, right? Um, and it was, it was Ben Shine who said, hey, listen, the way that you track engagement on a website is exactly how you should track engagement on your Domo instance, right? They're not, they're not different, they're one and the same, right? So simple things like, okay, what is an engagement metric that we care about on a website? It's visits, unique visits, and really then you start diving into the engagement and the conversion side of things, right? So a cool example that we actually use quite often is, you know, if you guys have scheduled reports in your Domo instance, just being able to see the click-through rate, right? See a click-through rate. I know that these, this set of reporting is going out to the executives. So if I have some level of acceptable click-through rate that either A, hit the mark, or B, was just kind of scroll noise, right? On the same side of thing, on the self-service side of things, you gotta think about it in terms of, cool, we're building self-service data sets, right? They're kind of semi-normalized. What the whole intent of that is, get them in the business unit's hands, let them engage with it, build some cool cards, do that same level of engagement. So if they have a couple set of data sets that you're, you know, in our sense, we release them every two weeks, are they being engaged with? How many cards have built, been built from it, right? How many people visited those cards? So kind of think about in terms of engagement, you know, like what Ben was saying is, think about engagement like you would on a website, right? It's about getting attraction, but also getting conversion. So we do kind of do the same thing um, in our Domo journey as well. So the role of the team champion. So if you guys have been in any of the Domo trainings, you'll see that you know, they got that football analogy, right? You got your, your owner, your GM, your head coach, your DC, and you got your offensive coordinator. Um, and we kind of had the same, we, we took that, we ran with it, and we have the similar setup, right? So at the top level, you have your executive, you know, executive sponsorship, which is super important, right? To get that level of transformation to say, hey, you guys need to start, start using this thing because we're gonna be looking. That's important, but at the bottom, you need strong data engineering, right? So you can get all these disparate data sources and get them together and get them working together. But in the middle is that team champion where they are dedicated to either a product, in our case, they're dedicated to a product team or they're dedicated to a discipline that spans you know, the different 17 products that we have, right? So we appointed some team champions that not necessarily were on a specific product, but we looked at our 17 products and said, okay, what are some common themes that we can kind of cross-functionally go across 
our 17 products, and those themes, we had ownership as team champions. So a team champion owned those different themes going across, all right? So after that, after the identification piece of it is, we needed them to get ingrained in data. And what's the easiest way to do that? Throw them in a room of data engineers. So in our sprint cycles, we actually had mandatory three-week sprint cycles where those team champions had to pair off with a data engineer and learn the in, ins and outs of actually generating, doing magic ETL, doing data fusions, right? Taking in disparate data from Salesforce, which data pieces need to be leveraged, which ones don't. And the kind of the cool thing that we ended up finding was with that kind of pairing, you saw the fail fast, fail forward, it is accent, accented so quickly where we have kind of a sprint backlog saying, we're gonna bring these data sources in, but you always have the question mark of, well, what's relevant and what's not? And usually it's, all right, just throw everything over the fence. We'll figure it out later. But when you actually pair off with team champions, they actually give you the real scenarios, in our case, that cut across the business and say, no, that's noise, this is relevant, and you forgot three more pieces, right? So kind of when you're doing, you know, kind of your transformation or if you are kind of have team champions, but they're not paying an integral, integral role, I would revisit that because they're, they're really key to our success. So the case study, yeah. take it over Tom. Yeah, so just to About set the minutes. stage for the, for the problem, you know, that we have with, with um, why we developed the solution that we need to develop. And that is to understand really the data situation inside the dealership. So just like the OEM, they have almost as complicated as a channel or an omni-channel situation when they're trying to make a connection with the customer as Ford would. Um, it's just the volumes are lower. So they have their website channel they're trying to deal with the customer, the paid media uh, with the advertising, search, social, and display, the direct communications, and then they have all this data coming inside the dealership itself across the showroom um, within the CRM, and then they have their transactional data, and it's, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's about as complex as you'd find in a small corporation. It's yeah. probably the most complicated retail business that, that's out there technically, right? And because the big data wave really hit them hard in the last 20 years, they've not been able to keep up with it on their own in terms of managing it in an effective way so they can start to eliminate a lot of the advertising waste that happens when they try to make a connection with the customer. As you can see, there's all these channels that, they're, that, they, that they execute upon, but none of them are really that connected because they've outsourced so much of the capability to partners and providers who have their own technology, their own way of measuring customer behavior, and they even store it in separate places. All right, so, um, you might have, I could, I could, there might be a, a, a shopper on the website that the dealer's trying to, to communicate with that was also on the paid media, but they can't connect it in the background. That the same person responding to display advertising or is in Facebook is also the same person that's been on the website and might even be the same person in their CRM and has been a loyal customer for 10 years. So this poses a big problem when it comes to figuring out how to, to make a direct connection and spend their money efficiently. So it's up to us um, and my team to essentially fill in those gaps since the dealers don't have much of an IT organization to do this themselves. And through our connected analytics platform, we're pulling data from all these different silos, essentially bringing it all together and trying to stitch that customer journey together down at the individual dealer level. Um, and then we also have to figure out you know, how to separate that between the customer's response you know, to tier one activity and maybe another dealer's activity. So there's a lot of data segregation we have to do across all these dealerships, as well as try to make sure we keep the identity management consistent so we can help each dealer try to com not compete in a fair way, but also in an effective way to get the customer into the, into the store. So bringing all this together in our sort of connected analytics platform and then getting that out into the hands of our field force is key and putting that together in a story-like fashion so that they can bring all that together to, you know, with the dealer in person is, uh, is essentially what our solution's all about with the online automated dealer digital assessment. So with that, Ed's yeah. gonna describe what that's about. So, interesting enough, this was actually the first project we did in Domo. So it was, hey, we need you to do self-service BI in Domo, but also we have this thing called the a digital assessment that we have, so painting a picture, 92 DPMs. And in 2017, they performed 7,000 assessments. Oh, by the way, each one of those assessments took 
two hours on average to generate. So that's what? Simple math, 14,000 hours times 92 DPMs was the investment that Ford Direct was making, or not making, allowing, right? That's probably a better way to look at it. And Tom goes, we need to do something about that. If you can give me a 10% time saving, we will be heroes, right? Just 10%, that's it. So obviously that's a pretty low bar. I mean, you know, kind of in our journey of, of Domo, we've been, we were at that point, had a couple key um, self-service pieces in place, right? So I was like, yeah, I think we can do it, but I'm not doing 10%. We're going to aim much higher than that. He goes, what number? I'm like, eh, I'm not going to commit yet, but um, it's going to be much higher than that. So that's kind of the, there was a problem statement. So diving into the solution a bit, um, what we ended up finding was when we kind of, and, and we'll go over how our development process is, but what we ended up doing was assembling a, a small squad full of DPMs, team champions, data engineers, and kind of coming together and saying, all right, we have 17 products. And today, a DPM, today back in 17, let's paint that nasty picture was, I actually sat with them and said, okay, show me what an assessment is, right? Because that's the first thing you want to do. Okay, I'm going to automate the system, but show me what it is. So 17 products, 17 different portals. Show of hands, in your web browser, are you guilty of having maybe 10 more tabs, 10, 10 plus tabs at the same time, maybe at least six, right? So your tabs go from here to here, right? And in, a, in an average assessment, the DPMs take about eight products and they talk about them. So eight products in a given assessment means I have eight different tabs open, right? And then I go into and I log into that vendor partner's dashboard and I'm scrolling and like, oh, that's a pretty interesting piece of information. So what they do is bring out the nice snipping tool, do a cut, bring it into Word or PowerPoint, paste, next thing. And they would rinse and repeat this. So what are they doing at, in essence? They're data preps, they're doing data prep on their own, going to 17 different vendor partner dashboards, and that's just the data prep side of it. So I sat with four DPMs during these sessions, and they did take all of two hours. On average, it was about an hour and 20 just to prep all of the data in one spot. So when they take that deep breath and said, okay, cool, finally, got all my charts. Oh, crap, what was the month over, what was the quarter over quarter? Then they have to go back and say, what was my assessment like? Oh. Oh crap, they're down 13%. And then, so what they end up having to do is wrangle the data, one. Number two, now they're in position to say, okay, here's the trends you have in terms of performance, here's the next best actions, and here's what we recommend. And that is two hours worth of work per assessment times 7,000 assessments. So simple. Our thing was simple, and, and really the solution in essence was we wanted to make it so painfully simple that that was its elegance, right? And you can kind of think of that old school, the new school, the new school, the old school thing was doing this in Domo is really simple, right? Have a page, have a bunch of data sets ready and available so that they can be semi-structured so that you can build some cards off of it. And using the squad, right? We built, we took all the DPM and said, here's all the data that's available. Show me at least maybe three samples of assessments you do today and let's dissect those. Let's put them up on a wall and figure out which one are the best to tell a good data story, right? Don't worry about the creative aspect of that. We'll naturally take care of that. But which parts of these take the best in terms of telling a data story? And we took those and just created a page. That's it. So that's the new school side of it, building cards, making sure all the correlations are correct, make sure the data prep's correct. When you have a page, what do you have from there? Oh, you have to do an assessment? Add a page filter and say, okay, Mr. DPM or Mrs. DPM, you are doing assessment on Lenore Ford. Go ahead and select it, hit save, save the page filter, open up this brand new template that we curated together, which had a consistent user experience in terms of the creative. It told a consistent data story because we took all those cards, put them in the right sections of the PowerPoint, right? So from soup to nuts, we told a consistent story and then Go to the Domo little PowerPoint integration, so this is the old school side of it. All you have to do, if you haven't done it yet, and actually one of our demos will show it is, you hit the Domo button and you hit refresh cards. And then boom, all the cards that you did 
on the page in the new school are now transported to the old school, which is practically Microsoft Office. So we, do, we chose PowerPoint just because it was just kind of a simple and natural transition. You can do it in Word, Excel, all of those things are good. But the end result of this was simply not, you know, taking that piece of, hey, DPMs, you gotta do data wrangling, all right? So that's an hour and 20. And then you have to do suggestions. We ended up taking about, on average, 40% of soups and nuts, taking that two hours, an average reduction of about 40% time in curating at least one of those um, digital assessments. So that was kind of our, our big time savings. And you know, the, the ones that are a little bit more in depth, adept to kind of navigating, they can cut it down from being 45 minutes down to, I sat with a lady, she did it in 20 minutes, and it was pretty impressive. But, you know, because their DPMs, they, they're really good at that all tab thing, right? So all they have to do is go to Domo, a couple switches here, go to the old school, go to PowerPoint, hit refresh cards, and they're right into the recommendations for the last maybe 10 minutes. And that's it. You go, Tom? Yeah, so in order to do this successfully, um, you know, it, it, just as you would with an online analytic solution to, for the DPMs, where you know they're either building a card collection or a domo page or a story. Um, we want to apply some analytics 101, which is using sort of like the four forms of analytics that are the best practices out there today in the industry, to a printed solution. And what we're trying to do, if you think about the organizations of the slides themselves in these presentations, along with the actual organization of the content on each slide, we want to do that in a way that extracts the most value out of the data, but is also in accordance in accordance to the conversation flow that typically happens between the consultant and the, DP and the uh, dealer. So if you think about it as a story, you know, typically you start with descriptive and, talking, and figuring out and explaining to the, the dealer what's happened in the last quarter in terms of their performance. So we're pulling metrics from the raw data, it's reactive, it's you know, looking back into the past. And we're looking at things like, you know, how many leads were generated on the website, how many leads were generated from the advertising or the email response. You know, are they generating enough online presence in terms of their search impression volume? Um, are they spending their money efficiently? And then once you establish the situation in terms of what's happened in the last quarter, we want to understand why it happened, right? So we're getting a little bit more intelligent with the data. It's still looking back, um, but we start to do some diagnostic analytics on, on the performance itself. Is the dealer's name appearing high up in the search results? Um, what's their ratio of positive online reviews to negative online reviews? Are the photos on their website up to date and clear? Things of that nature. And then once we've done that, hopefully we can establish some predictive analytics for them in terms of giving them an idea of what's gonna happen next in the next quarter based upon our understanding of where we are and why it's happened, right? So, um, right now we're in the process of building a scenario planning tool which essentially looks at different budget allocations across the advertising channel that predicts um, what their next lead volume and sales might be like depending upon the mix. So when you start to have that kind of conversation with them inside the dealership and it starts to build a lot of trust and that hopefully leads to them listening to some prescriptive or recommendations that we can give them in terms of what they need to do uh, next, right? So we you know what happened, why it happened, what's going to happen next, now what are we going to do about it, right? And you really can't, it's, it's hard to get to the prescriptive state in, unless you have good, solid diagnostic and predictive analytics to um, essentially fuel that. And whether that's modeling or it's a lot of qualitative understanding, um, we basically want to set up for the dealer what's the next three to five things they should do to improve their digital performance, right? So that could be something quantitative like increase their spend in social media to target customers in Facebook that are listed in their CRM. It could be something more qualitative, like, hey, you have a strong reputation score, you should probably include that in your search results. Um, so the challenge for us as, a, as an analytics organization is how do we um, generate those recommendations at scale across all the dealerships and do it in a way that can also be somewhat customized uh, for the dealer and is also natural, natural in the conversation flow between the consultant and the dealer. So I'm gonna let Ed take it the rest of the way and talk about the development yep. process and what the solution looks like. Yep. So <clears throat> everybody has their own flavor of, you know, I guess call it iterative development, right? You got Agile, Scrum, Safe, which is scaled Agile framework, 
um, speed to value. One that we kind of resonate most with is, if you haven't done it yet, I, I, I would definitely do a Google search for Spotify Agile methodology. So it's, it's more centered around um, doing squads and tribes, where the whole point is you don't ha necessarily have somebody who is, hey, you're really good at digital advertising, That's you're gonna put you in a silo and say, whenever we need that, I need you. Whenever we need reputation, I need you. Whenever we need leads, I need you. It's more around the discipline of kind of spinning up a team rapidly, getting to the business value, and then tearing down and looking for the next thing, right? So in this case, we spun up a team pretty quick and got to alpha and within about, I think, four weeks, got to a beta in six. And um, you know, the, the team mixture of the squads were five DPMs who kind of were sort of the kind of thing about it is the steering committee. The team champions who understood the data quite well, data engineering, to kind of wrangle it together. And right at about that two month time frame, we were, ready, we were in our iterative cycle of QA. So it was just something, you know, something we just want to outline for you guys. Think about just a way that you can not necessarily pigeonhole somebody um, with a specialty, right? We do a lot, a lot, a lot of rotating on an agile and on a bi-weekly basis so that you know, we just don't have people that get to do one thing, right? The kind of the beauty of doing a lot of this agile methodology stuff is, A, we do a central model, so you hear about a lot of things, and then we actually put that person in a position to actually perform something on a self-service side or even on a project side with the intention of, hey, I have the subject matter expert next to, me, next to me, right? So I can get spun up really fast in terms of that knowledge transfer. All right. So next we're gonna play the demo. So it just kind of gives you a look and feel of... <laughs> So there's just kind of a, a preview or a kind of a, so we use that as a sizzle reel. And actually the request was, was, um, was pretty funny. Tom's like, hey, we need to really tease this thing out to carry our, our senior VP. I'm like, okay. So we ended up creating that sizzle reel in probably like an hour. And it ended up gaining some, some pretty cool traction. Um, but in terms of the things that we learned, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, VPM and training awareness. So the one, <laughs> One of the things that, that's kind of unique in our scenario is we have 92 DPMs, right? And they're spread across all over the US. So how do you train some 92 DPMs on how to use a platform like this? So we did a kind of a, a mixture of training material and just simple actual training video snippets, um, a couple bit, a bit of Word documentation, and then we did for six weeks straight, we had uh, two WebExes, your standing WebExes, People dial in, and I go through the experience of how to generate an assessment. So, as soon as you as soon as you join one, it's up to you to say, "All right, I'm going to join another one." Right. So it's kind of a kind of a multifaceted approach there. All right. Um, things that we learned. So, creating the automated assessment using Domo, um, we found that. Oh goodness, you might you might have heard that in the keynote. Uh, I think our data lake is actually Domo, and we're kind of trending towards that, right? So having to pull together all the different product data pieces to assemble this kind of big thing called the D automated DPM assessment, we are trending towards that. So the, which kind of the second piece is awesome because, hey, our data is in Domo now, we can do data prep pretty quick, right? Whether that's Fusion, whether that's Magic ETL. And um, with a bit of good data engineering, a lot of those organic kind of correlations of data with your team champions pairing off with your data engineers, they happen a lot faster and they are a heck of a lot more meaningful. And then the last one, which is fun, um, ensure proper support once deployed. So 
we do the Spotify model, right? So we come together, then we tear down. Well, we kind of tore down probably a week after the project was done, and then nine, a couple of the deep firms like, hey, I see a data anomaly. Is that a bug, or did the, you know, was there something wrong with the performance? We're like, ooh. So we had to reassemble back up um, just for kind of maintenance mode for three months. So when you're doing a product of scale like this, just to make sure that you have some folks that are dedicated, almost like a you know, call, you know, call center support type of atmosphere. All right? Yeah, and just to close out that point, you know, I don't know if any of you are starting to encounter this, but with the tools that are available um, to analytics organizations, they're, they're, they're really scalable uh, development platforms, right? So what we find is we are developing more and more solutions that require more formalized support that you would find in like an IT organization. So you either need to work really closely with your IT organization, let them know that, hey, we just developed this on our own. It might be something that typically the IT organization does, but now we, this newer organization data strategy, BI, and analytics has actually become an application shop or a software development shop. And you're, you're building these solutions, hubs, internal you know, online systems for right. your company, right, that typically would have come you know, through, From your through IT the IT organization. organization. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're doing it. And this is one of those where we happened to build it so quickly that it kind of caught um, us off guard and that, well, we really don't have the support and maintenance <laughs> <laughs> structure in place. <laughs> To, to support this thing properly for almost 100 people in the field, right? So we've since, uh, you know, I guess you could say migrated it into a more IT uh, suite of services and application side of the company to formalize that process. So it's where, you know, again, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting, but, you know, you do have to plan ahead and figure out, you know, how are you going to maintain and support this going forward into the future, and especially if it becomes critical to the organization. So, questions? I'm the mic right here. There you go. Hi. So, uh, you, you were show, showing your reports, PowerPoint reports and all. They're more like, uh, if, if you're talking about the leads perspective, they're probably lead reports or leads generated by country or leads generated by region, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, how good, how good is the tool on the automation part? Like, apart from reports, text automation. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely see this uh, text automation is really tough when compared to data points. Data points, you can just plug in charts, sure. graphs, that, that can be done. So what's your view on uh, text automation and how did you solve that or how did you even approach it? So that's, that's a good question. I mean, right now, when you look at how that assessment was built, if you're watching the video, you. you know, what we did is essentially built a script that structures the addressable places on the slides for where the content comes straight out of Domo, the cards, whatever they might be. And then there's these open spaces right. in the PowerPoints for the DPMs to load in their, you know, their insights, right? Um, our, the next stage we're trying to get to is actually take more feedback from the field and use natural language processing to figure out what certain problems are to feed that into the overall platform. But then on the outbound side, what you're talking about is automated text generation would be like our stage two. Right. Right? So if we can get to a point where we see a lot of common recommendations that are needed based upon certain rules and situations we see or we can pull in from the field from the text that these DPMs are also loading in about what the experience was like with the dealer. I mean, that would essentially be where we want to go. So my viewpoint on, on that is that it's just a matter of time. Yep. Got a question over here? To the report for either a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. Are you recording those as a historical and then measuring against those at the next assessment? So that yeah. essentially is the first stage that I was talking about, right? So we will store them, um, but ideally what we want to do is use some natural language processing or text analytics on that to try and tease out keywords that mean certain things, right? And we just, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. So um, it's such a monumental chore just to create a PowerPoint that is standard enough for 60% of how the DPMs use it in the field today. Because prior to this, they had their own decks that they were creating that looked well, wildly different. And as Ed was saying, the first step was trying to figure out, all right, what's some commonalities among all this stuff that they were doing on their own? And a lot of it was screenshots from these partner dashboards that represent these products. 
Um, and we're starting to move away from that um, because what we would do as an analytics organization is pull data in from the back end and build our own consolidated sort of holistic view, but just with certain KPIs, right? Yeah. If I so, want to actually look at the search results that is appearing a lot for the dealers, they still got to go out and do a cut and paste of those results, put them in that assessment in that presentation so they can have a conversation about it when it gets to that point. So that was the tricky part. And those are those open blank spaces we try to just produce um, out of the automated build. That build comes to the DPM and they do their cut and pasting from wherever because they know kind of how that conversation is going to go with that particular dealer. Right. And there's, there's scenarios where you don't want to over-engineer something. Because if you actually fundamentally think about it, when I generate an assessment for April 17th, April 18th, fast forward to May, the best thing I should probably do for that dealer is open up that one and do a file save as, right? And then just date it May 18th. And what you end up having there in your recommendations, your recommendations were back from the March assessment, right? When you refresh the cards, just the data elements, the cards, the actual DOMA cards are the things that get refreshed. Everything else stays the same. So that was something we knew going in, that you'll have that kind of, what did I talk about last month? It's baked in uh, just using some simple constructs such as like save as, all right? This is just a really good example of where the qualitative and the quantitative are yep. really smashed together. Right. In terms and uh, we're just trying to do our best to automate that as much as we can. And, and, and Domo's really been the first platform that we found that we, can, that we can do that quickly. And if we need to adjust, it's, it's easy to do that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Any questions? Sure. Just to give some uh, background behind the question. So uh, we, are a, we are an Artec Martech firm, and we run campaigns and lead gen, lead gen and display campaigns, B2B marketing. So. Uh, Similar, similarly, uh, a campaign report is what we do monthly basis, but then uh, we are using Domo. We have recently signed up with Domo on uh, setting up a campaign report, automating it, rather than our customer success sitting for like four days and developing a big campaign report which is useless for their respective clients, rather than this is what we are planning. Mm -hmm. So could you shed some light on the process you have started from, from scratch to productionize? So what are the best practices which kind of help you or might help in our process, which we are undergoing probably in a week or so. Yeah. Yep. All right, so you're, you're, you're uh, trying to produce uh, specific campaign reporting. So, uh, so a lot of what we have in these assessments are digital marketing related. Um, and so we haven't fully explored digital 360. Um, and so, I think if, if you're going to start, I'd start there. Um, and if you're, are you also talking about trying to get it into, into a printed format so it tells a story? Yes, it's kind of a Have you delved into the um, dashboarding features yet yes. of Domo? Stories. Stories. Yeah. Stories. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you're, you're just, you're, if you're focused solely on campaign performance, I would assume that uh, a combination of Digital 360 and Stories might, and, and then you port that out to PowerPoint, you know, it, 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 if you can arrange it in a way that kind of tells the story the way you want to or according to like the four forms, right. I mean, that would probably be where I would start in my thinking. Um, we don't necessarily have that luxury because we, the, the consultants go in there and they talk every, about everything from they talk about aggregate performance mainly because we don't manage campaigns directly. So we can't just easily use Digital 360. And they're also doing things like online reputation management. It, it doesn't fall into like Digital 360 very well. So there's all these other things that we got to paste together. But I think in your case, you could probably start there and you might um, get something going pretty quick. Yep. Other questions? There you go. I have a like, uh, non-technical question. Since you're working with the DPMs, and admittedly, you probably got better than 10% time savings, is there some kind of human side of element of what Domo has been able to do to really save in time and make that quality of conversation with the dealers better? Uh, absolutely. So if you think about you know, the spectrum of time saving, right? You have a chunk of time now back into your, your week, right? Your day, your week, your month. 
And what we've been finding is that they've been dedicating that time to how else can I service a dealer better? And it kind of, you know, that was the question. And then all of a sudden, another thing came about, which was, guess what, DPMs? In addition to all these product management, you're going to do lead management too, which is a huge side of our business, right? So in that event where they weren't using the, the automated assessment, you're talking about 100, you know, 120 to 140 percent utilization of time now, and where we would have to practically staff up even more, maybe to spread out the wealth, um, instead of, thank you, instead of, you know, effectively managing and using the time that they currently have. Awesome. All right. And I'd say the other, the big human impact also is, you know, before we figured out a way to get into the printed um, presentation, I mean, we set up uh, a pretty elaborate card collection taxonomy that, so the DPMs could go in there and do their own self-service BI to some degree. I mean, they're all participants, I mean, and, but there are some uh, specialists on that team that are editors and, and are experimenting with their own cards and things of that nature. But it just, they've, they've evolved quite a bit from just asking for reports and doing cut and pastes from dashboards and things of that nature to doing, you know, filtering on their own, changing the cards up in different ways that fit yeah. them. So it's kind of, I think it's expanded a different way of thinking for them right. um, that as we start to evolve this and get more data into their hands, they'll, they'll do even more with it. All right. It's that aspect of data curiosity that we actually, you know, kind of elevated. That's awesome. So, thank you. Yep. So let's close out. Um, Ed and Tom, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you.